The last topic we have to look at in order to complete our investigation of matter and energy is looking at mixtures in particular in a little more detail and to that end we're going to look at how we might go about separating mixtures into their component pure substances. So remember that when we define pure substances and compare them to mixtures, pure substances by definition differ from mixtures because they only have one chemical subunit, be that a molecule, a collection of atoms bonded together, or atoms, which is the smallest individual particle that maintains the chemical properties of the element. Because they only have one chemical subunit, or molecular unit, they only have one set of chemical properties. When we look at mixtures, mixtures have two different kinds of molecular subunits and because of that they have different chemical properties. These properties themselves can be used in order to separate the mixtures into its components. So we'll quickly take a look at the methods that we'll have available to us and then we'll look at each one in particular in a little more detail. So we can use a magnet, we can filter, we can decant a process that you may not have seen before but you may have heard the word particularly if your parents or an uncle or an aunt um, like to drink red wine. Um, evaporation, centrifuge, chromatography, distillation. So the first one we're going to talk about very quickly is probably the most intuitive and that's magnetic. So you may be wondering why I have a picture of a bowl of cereal to represent something magnetic. What we can see is that lots of brand name cereals, lots of them now, have been iron fortified. And if you actually take a magnet, um, you can actually separate out the dissolved iron from the cereal. In order to do so, we need to have one component which is magnetic, where the other one, or at least one other one, is not. And remember that when we say magnetic, most people remember ferrous things, so that's iron, but also nickel is also magnetic, and so is gadolium, but we don't use that very much. The second method is filtration, and filtration um, separates a liquid from a solid. In other words, it can be used for specific kinds of heterogeneous mixtures. Remember from when we defined them right at the beginning of the unit, heterogeneous means more than one visible component. You can actually see physical differences in the material. Hetero as a root means different, so heterogeneous means different forms. When you look at how a filter functions, we have to remember that our mixture of materials gets poured in through the top so this is a mixture going in at the bottom and the liquid, the liquid component only which isn't necessarily a pure substance but is now a liquid separate from a solid is called the filtrate afterwards. Looking at how that works in a little more detail, again this would be our mixture up here and this is our filtrate. Remember, like I said just a second ago, the filtrate is not necessarily a pure substance. You could put salt water through a filter and it would pass directly through the filter. That salt water filtrate is not a pure substance because it's composed of two different chemical subunits, one being salt and one being water. Now looking at how it's functioning in a little more detail, what we see is that filter paper or any other kind of screen filter is going to function because of a difference in molecular size. So what we see is that there's these pores or spaces in the filter paper or other screen that allow some molecules to go through and it blocks others. The third method we're going to look at is chromatography. Chromatography separates molecules based on a difference in their molecular size or their affinity for what we'll call in a minute a stationary phase. Um, this really is only useful for small samples. So you would not want to take a liter of mixture and separate it by chromatography. That's not practical. Um, but a couple of real world examples that you would be familiar with already are tie-dye functions based on the basic principles of chromatography. That's how we separate the different pigments at different rates. And DNA testing, like this one here.
Uh, in class next day, we're actually going to look at how paper chromatography works, um, and it is a simplistic form of all chromatography. So in all chromatography, we have a stationary phase. That's what the material moves through, what the molecule is going to be separated on, and it has to have some kind of mobile phase. The mobile phase simply moves your material across the stationary phase. We also have to have our samples and we have to have a starting point or a reference point for where the sample started. So I'm going to take a sample of red dye, green dye, and black dye. Zooming in on that, there's the red, green, and black. And as the mobile phase moves up the paper, it will differentially separate the different pigments. We will mark the end of the mobile phase. And as you're going to see next day, the comparison between how far the pigment moves compared to how far the mobile phase moves actually gives us a very specific uh, reference value called an RF value, a run front value, and we can use that to actually help us identify specific pigments. Another kind of chromatography is gas chromatography. It's used in forensics and in analytical chemistry. Um, and like all other kinds, we have the stationary phase. In this case, it's a, a column, which is solid, and a mobile phase, this time a gas, which sweeps the sample down the column. Also, we have at the end of the column a detector, which is a precise measuring uh, tool, which um, measures the amount that is passing by the detector at any specific point in time. So looking again at how this is going to work, I have my stationary phase, that's the solid, I've got the gas that's going to sweep it down, and I have a sample of the mixture at the top. These are very small samples, so you would think of it as being a syringe because you can see that it's a syringe, but this is actually a micro syringe, so microliter amounts. That's millionths of a liter of amount. So we inject the sample into the stationary phase, and the mobile phase will sweep it down the column. And depending on when it reaches the detector, it would be identified appropriately. If we looked at the iron chromatogram of orange juice, it would look something like this. And what we can tell from this is the relative rate that the different ions are able to move through the stationary phase. In this case, we see that sodium moves through the fastest, where calcium is the slowest of the components moving through. We can also see relative amounts of the ions. So we can see in this particular one that there is much more potassium than any other ion and that um, magnesium, iron, and calcium are relatively low compared to sodium and potassium. Now the next method we're going to look at, I should have a title here, is evaporation. So evaporation amounts to boiling off a liquid in a mixture. But unlike the next technique, which we'll be looking at, you do not trap the gas. So that or originally liquid material is lost. To um, a slow evolution of our fifth method, which is distillation. And the first form of it was called a hero's fountain, which amounts to having, again, a heat source. We have our sample in this bulbous area. And the difference here is that we actually will not necessarily trap the gas, but we gave it a long spout, which helps for the vapor to condensate. So the next thing we came up with, and this represents method number five, is a distillation apparatus. And it looks like this. So we have our liquid sample, which is our mixture, in the original round bottom flask. It then boils. Let's just for argument's sake, or so that we can understand it a little more easily, say that this contains acetone and water. 
Now acetone and water are important because they have different boiling points. If you had the same boiling point, you couldn't use distillation. So when we look at acetone and water, acetone boils at a relatively low temperature. So once it gets to a certain temperature, let's throw out there 50 degrees, the acetone will start to boil. Can the water boil at 50 degrees? Well, no. So the acetone will boil and rise up as a gas because we know gases, hot gases will rise. Because acetone as a gas is continually being produced, it will get funneled down or pushed down and into um, the condenser, a column. And this is the improvement on the hero's fountain. What we see is that once it reaches the water outside jacket, which wraps around the outside, there's cold water that's continually being pushed into that column. The cold water helps that gas to condense back into a liquid, and as a result, acetone comes out as a liquid at the end. Now, once you, you would continue to boil it until you saw your temperature change, and as soon as you saw your temperature rise, you would know, oh, I'm not boiling acetone anymore, and you would switch out the receiving flask. Now, it is important to talk about the fact that when we look at distillation or any other separation technique, that there's no chemical change that happens. So if you have a sample of salt water, and it undergoes distillation, you have separated salt and water at the end. You have not changed the components of the salt water, you simply separated them. Method number six is centrifuge, and centrifuge spins samples very quickly and separates them on the basis of their density. The denser the material, the more quickly it moves to the bottom. In this way, biologists, lab technologists, happen to be able to separate blood into serum and plasma, taking out the red and white blood cells, which are much more dense than the plasma itself, um, and spins it to the bottom. Now, just to quickly talk about one point which people get confused about, we need to think about water molecules. If I look at a sample of water, water, H2O, all on its own, that represents a pure substance. So my question is, well, can I use a separation technique to separate a pure substance? No. What happens if you want to separate water is that you can actually use an electrical current and it separates it into its atomic subunits, into oxygen and hydrogen. Similar to this particular apparatus, notice that we get twice as much hydrogen being produced as oxygen, and that's because of that 2 to 1 ratio in the formula H2O. Just to define electrolysis, electrolysis, electro as a root comes from electricity, lysis means to split or to kill, so electricity splitting or killing is how we split water into its atomic components. The question I have for you to finish off here is why does electrolysis not represent a separation technique? And it's a common mistake that people make. Why does electrolysis not represent a, a separation technique? Well, what we see is that separation techniques separate components but does not cause a chemical change. Electrolysis changes what chemical subunits are actually there. Instead of having water as a molecular unit, we now have oxygen and hydrogen. This is where we're going to leave our discussion of matter. Um, we'll do a short lab next day looking at particularly how paper chromatography works as a method. Um, and then next week, we're actually going to be moving into starting our look at the mole.